And while they're heading out, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 17. We'll be in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19 this morning. If you're using the Bibles provided for you in the chairs, you'll find it, I believe, on page 876. Right out that way, over there. Yep. So as we continue our series through the Gospel of Luke, we come to... Uh, a brief narrative, only, you know, only a handful of verses, and uh, we've been doing these larger chunks of, of the gospel. People, I know you're going to be like, well, what, you know, we're going to be done early today. It's only like a couple verses. <laughs> Trust me, we're not going to get done early. But anyway, so we, we're, we're journeying through the, the gospel of Luke. We come to this, this one narrative this morning, and the, the, and the main point of this narrative is to return thanks, to give thanks to uh, the Lord. And, and the idea of giving thanks is a powerful thing. We can see in our own lives when we take the time to thank those around us, to say those two words, thank, thank you, to, to offer that up to a parent, to a teacher, to a coach, to our children, to, to those around us. Uh, we had the opportunity, Dan and I had lunch together on Friday, and we shared a word of thanks and appreciation to the, the waitress who happens to be the same waitress who serves the men's Bible study on Wednesday morning. And she stayed at our table and just thanked us so much for those words because she had heard some pretty critical words from one customer. And she said, you know, all the words of thanks get lost sometimes in that one critical word. There's power uh, in saying thank you. And in fact, I, I, I put that in the, a, a search engine this week online, you know, the power of thanksgiving. And a, a bunch of Christian sites come up and talk about the the, how the Bible commands us to give thanks. But what was interesting to me was the number of, of universities, including Harvard, uh, psychological uh, organizations and, and leading psychologists that are out there, as well as uh, Reuters and Forbes, all had articles about the power of thanksgiving. Uh, one psychologist, his name is uh, Robert Emmons, he said this, he said, gratitude, or thanksgiving, is one of the strongest links to mental health and satisfaction with the life of any personality trait. Another study that after 10 weeks, people were told to, to focus on things to be thankful for for 10 weeks, and they were more optimistic, they felt better about their lives, they exercised more, and they had fewer visits to physicians. Uh, another study demonstrated that those, now this seems obvious when you get done, like, do we have to do a study for this? But listen, so they did a study, and those who were thankful about another person, rather than focusing on their faults, ended up with a more positive attitude about the other person and their relationship. I mean, it's kind of like a duh moment, but how often we forget about being thankful for those around us rather than focusing on their, their faults. And so it's good to have a study to tell us what we should know anyway. Another study um, looked at the study group that was told to ha keep a thankful journey, journal, and they actually measured changes in brain activity. Like being thankful changes the way our brain functions. Interestingly enough, um, one article said that the benefits of being thankful, it takes our attention off of ourselves, helps us to see and appreciate others, and realize that we need others. So that's, that's in the, the world around us, they recognize the power of being thankful. How much more, when we turn to Scripture, we see that we're to be overflowing with thankfulness. Scripture from the beginning pages of Genesis all the way to the Last pages of Revelation remind us to give praise to the Lord, to be thankful to the Lord. Over 150 times in Scripture where we read about being thankful to the Lord. In the Old Testament, there's 100 references roughly that tell us to give thanks for His steadfast love that endures to forever, to give thanks because He's good, to give thanks because of His mighty deeds, to give thanks because of His salvation. Jonah, while he's in the belly of the great fish, gives thanks to God. King David, as he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, and then also Nehemiah tells us that as the, the people were being reestablished in Jerusalem after the exile, both times there were actually Levites, there were priests that were set aside, and here was their assignment. Their assignment were to be the, the, the Levites who sang songs of praise. That was their job to lead the people in sing, singing songs of thanksgiving. In the New Testament, we're commanded over and over again to be thankful. 
Colossians 3.17, we read, Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, we're told to give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And I could go on. Thanksgiving is a major theme and a major topic of Scripture that we're to pay attention to. And as we go through Luke 17, 11 through 19 this morning, we see why thankfulness should be a regular part of a daily part of how we live our lives. We're going to see this morning our miserable condition and God's miraculous transformation that He worked in us through Christ and therefore our worship-filled life of thanksgiving should be a result. And so I encourage you to first to examine your own heart. Do you know God's grace? And if you do... Do you have a heart of thanksgiving before the Lord? Or have you allowed sort of an attitude that assumes that the love and the grace and the mercy of God is just normal? That even somehow you feel you deserve or are entitled to the love and the grace and mercy of God. You see, when we're humble and we're thankful, our lives, our worship, our Bible reading and study, our attentiveness when someone is teaching or preaching, our our singing and worship, our evangelism is transformed because we understand it's not about us. Every aspect of our lives as followers of Christ will be dramatically transformed if we're thankful. So let's consider this example of giving thanks and make it a reality in our hearts and lives. So let me read Luke 17 verses 11 through 19. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for life. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your work in us and through us. We thank you for the, the, the gathering of people that you've put around us, the, the fellow believers that can encourage us and strengthen us and hold us accountable and encourage us in our walk with the Lord. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done and all that you will do in and through us. Lord, we thank you for your word that lets us know more of who you are and how you're at work in us. Lord, we give you all the praise. Forgive us, Father, for the times that we have failed to give thanks, that we have somehow taken on an attitude where we think we we deserve something from you. And Lord, may you be at work in us now as we hear your word, that we would have hearts filled with thanksgiving for your praise. Amen. Luke begins in verse 11, <clears throat> reminding us that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And, and it's not just a, a narrative of telling us the direction Jesus was going. If we go back to chapter 9, verse 51 of Luke, we're reminded, or Luke told us then, that Jesus had set his face to Jerusalem. And it was at that point that the, this section of the gospel of Luke is kind of opened up for us. And this section of, of the gospel is the journey to Jerusalem. And from 951 on, it's within that last year of Jesus' life. It's in the shadow of the cross. And, and right here in Luke 17, he's up near Galilee. He's up in, uh, near the Sea of Galilee, up near his, his hometown between 
It's between Galilee and Samaria. He's on the journey down. He's, we're seeing him now probably on the final journey south to Jerusalem. In fact, it's, we're only two chapters away now. In Luke 19, we have the triumphal entry. This is probably his final trip down along that Jordan Valley and then up to Jerusalem before he's crucified. And, and we have this moment. Now, he enters this village. Here's the setting. He enters this, this village between Samaria and Galilee. And as he enters the village, we're, we're introduced to these ten men that, are, that are, have this miserable condition called leprosy. And they're standing at a distance, and they're crying out with one thing. And their cry is a plea to God, plea to the Lord, Lord, Master, have mercy mercy, have pity, have compassion on us. What is leprosy? Let's take a, a moment just to consider what these ten men were suffering under. Leprosy begins with specks on the skin, the bleaching of hair, crusting the skin with white scales, terrible sores, and swelling. From the outside, from the skin, the disease works its way inward to the bones, rotting the body piece by piece. It was incredibly painful. It was incurable and uncomfortable. We still have leprosy today. It's known as Hansen's disease, and a million people around the world suffer from it, but our treatment has, treatments have been developed, and so the earlier we can get it, the better we do. But then there was no cure. They were physically facing in, in, intense pain and suffering. But not only the physical pain and suffering, Leviticus 13, God gives commands that if you're suffering from leprosy, there was a certain thing you had to do. And so it, I'm not going to turn there, but let me just share some of the things that Leviticus 13, the law of Moses tells them what they should do. First, they were to wear torn clothes. Second, they were to, to leave their hair unkept and uncovered. Third, they were to cover the lower part of their face. These were all signs of the fact that they were grieving their own death. In essence, they were kind of like the walking dead. They were, they were already dead to the world around them. They were to, be, to, to warn others and cry out, unclean, unclean, unclean. And so as they would go about, they would have to scream out, unclean, unclean, unclean. So everybody knew they were there. They weren't to speak directly to anyone or return a greeting since that would involve some form of embrace. Think about the analogy when we're sick. What do we do? We, we want to warn somebody, I'm not going to shake your hand today. I'm, I'm not feeling good, right? So we, we understand that, that warning. They weren't to embrace anybody. They weren't to get near to anybody because then they would make them unclean. They were to live alone, though sometimes we see lepers Grow to get, live together in, in sort of a, uh, a cluster of lepers. But whether they were alone or they were outcasts, they, or alone together, they were outcasts from society. Think of, think of COVID and, and being, being alone. And the, we felt that, that aloneness. Now you have no end to being secluded and an outcast. That was the life of a leper. There was no end to that. They had the physical suffering, the pain, and they were an outcast of society. And because they were ceremonially unclean, they weren't allowed to go to the temple. They weren't allowed to go into the very presence of God. They were, they were not only kept separate from society, they were kept separate from God himself because of their disease. And so here they are, and Jesus comes to town, and they've heard, they've probably heard about this one, Jesus. And so their only recourse is to stand a distance away and cry out, Lord, Master, have pity on us. Have mercy on us. Show compassion to us. Before we move on, consider our miserable condition and how the, the leper is, is a picture for us of our own condition. Leprosy is an outward and visible sign of our spiritual corruption, sin corrupts, sin destroys, sin defiles man's inner nature. inner nature. It renders us unfit to enter the presence of a holy God. Scripture says that as a, a sinner, we are dead in our sin, much like they, 
They walked around grieving their own death. As a sinner, we are dead before God. We are unable to enter his presence. We are unclean. We are kept separate from him. We are outcast from the presence of our very creator. And sin corrupts every part of our, bo- of our being, our, bo- our body, mind, and soul. Every one of us has sinned. Every one of us was born a sinner. Our nature from day one is to pursue selfish ambition, rebel against God's authority, and seek our own way. Our sinful nature inflicts every part of our life, corrupts our thoughts, our words, our actions, it destroys our relationships, and it leads to death. So like the leper, we're left with only one course of action. To turn to our Creator and cry out, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy. Verse 14, we see something wonderful. Jesus saw them. Think about those words right there. How often have you walked through the city and, and there's the, the beggar on the side of the road and we don't see them? Because we don't want to be bothered. Here are ten lepers and Jesus could have kept on going. Jesus saw them. Jesus sees you and me in our miserable condition as sinners. Jesus went to the cross for you and me in our miserable condition because he saw us. He had mercy on us. He, He sees them and he tells them, go to the priest. Now, back in Luke chapter 5, there was a leper who came to him, and Jesus touched the leper. That's the unthinkable, but he touched the leper and healed him. And then he sent him to the priest. This time, he looks at these ten lepers, and he says, now go show yourself to the priest. And and that's in obedience to Leviticus 14. Leviticus 14 tells us what a leper who was healed of his leprosy was to do. If, If the leprosy went away, this is what he was supposed to do. And in Leviticus 14, we're told that he's supposed to go to the priest, have the priest examine him. And then a sacrifice was to be made. They're to wash their clothes, shave off all their hair, bathe with water, and then they can enter the city. But they must stay out of their their own dwelling for seven days. On the seventh day, they shave, shave off their head again, including their eyebrows. They wash their clothes, they bathe with water. Now they're considered clean. Then on the eighth day, they had to bring three animals and other materials for five different offerings. There was a guilt offering, a sin offering, a burnt offering, a grain offering to the temple. It was four, but there's actually five sacrifices to be made. Eight days, five sacrifices. Oh, that was the fifth one was at the beginning. That's the fifth sacrifice. Four on the last day, one in the beginning. I knew there was five. I just hadn't counted correctly. But anyway, so this was a costly process. It took great sacrifice, great obedience to go through this process, being declared clean. What's interesting is Jesus told them to go show themselves to the priests. When he told them that, were they clean? Were they healed? No. They're still lepers. It didn't make sense. In fact, if they go to the priest and they get into the presence of the priest while they're still covered with leprosy, that was a, a, a grievous thing to do and could lead to the death penalty for them. But they acted in obedience. So this very step now, as they go on their way, it doesn't make sense to them. And yet they act in obedience to Jesus and they're on their way. And while they're going, it says that they were cleansed. What What a miraculous moment. It has nothing to do with their obedience. It has everything to do with what Jesus has done. Jesus cleansed them while they were on their way, following his word, acting in obedience to him. Jesus provided this wonderful cleansing for them. And again, this is a great picture of what Jesus has done for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 10, we read that when we were God's enemies, still rejected, defiled sinners, we were reconciled to God through the death of Jesus Christ. 
when the Holy Spirit works in us and opens our heart to know our sinfulness and our, our desperate condition before God and we cry out, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. We repent and believe in Christ for the forgiveness of sin. This miraculous transformation takes place in our hearts, in our lives. We go from being enemies of God to being reconciled to Him. And to do that, we, must, we have to do what seems contrary to our very nature. You see, our sin nature wants to do things on our own. Our sin nature is determined to make ourselves right with God through a good life, through religion, through good thoughts, through every way possible. Yet in the pages of the Bible, we're told that we have to give up trying to save ourselves. We have to, to turn to Him, turn to Jesus Christ, and only through faith in Christ can we get rid of that that sinful condition, that leprous condition that we have, that miserable condition. But when we trust in Christ, this miraculous transformation takes place. We go from being lost to being found. We go from being an enemy of God to being reconciled to God. We go from being a child of this world, rejected by God, to being an adopted child of God, being loved by Him and a co-heir with Christ. We go from death to life. It's a miraculous transformation that takes place in our lives. We go from being outside of the presence of God to having the very presence of God within us as the Holy Spirit indwells every true believer. What a, what a wonderful thing. And then here's the, the beauty of, of this picture. Jesus is our priest. So just as they had to go to the priest and show themselves cleansed, we, we go to our priest, he, clen he cleanses us, and, and he's the one who paid the, the price. He's the one who paid the sacrifice. He's the one who, who paid it all for us. We don't have to go and, and bring five sacrifices and go the eight days and all the stuff that they went through. We go with joy because he did it all for us. He made us right. And so because of what we once were and what he has done in us, what should be our response? Well, now notice what happens in, in the text here. Ten of them were there crying out, Lord, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus sends all ten of them to go show themselves to the priest. All ten of them are cleansed. But only one of them returns to Jesus. Notice in verses 15 and 16, we, we read the fact that they were all on, on that journey to, to, to the priest. And we're not told about the other nine. So one returns to Jesus, the other nine were left to assume they go to the priest, the priest looks over you know, their skin, determines that the, the leprosy is gone, they go through those eight days process, they're declared cleansed, they do all the sacrifices, all that kind of stuff. They walk in obedience and they are, they are cleansed. And, and they return to society as a, a, a once they were a leper, now they're not a leper kind of person. And they get to be part of society again. And this one man determines that that's not good enough. Consider what it must have been like. Look what it says here in verse 15. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed. Can you imagine? You've been a leper. You've had the pain. You've watched parts of your body become numb, perhaps even falling away, skin scales falling off of you, the, the desperateness of your condition, and all of a sudden now, you've got feeling again. The numbness is gone. The, your skin is whole. The, the bones are, are no longer what they were. You realize that there's been a physical healing. I, I can only imagine the joy that overwhelmed him in that moment. He probably turned and hugged one of the other guys, and and they're like, this is awesome. And those nine, they went off to go show themselves to the priest. And he returns because he says, this healing was from Jesus. It's not from the priest. It's from Christ. I need to go back to Christ. And he comes. Look how he comes. He doesn't just come back. Jesus, thank you so much. That was good. That really that was good, Jesus. Thank you. Look how he comes back. He's praising God with a loud voice. He's, he's going through the streets praising God with a loud voice. He wants everybody to know what Jesus has done for him. 
He's praising God. He's coming to Christ, and he is shouting it out loud. He wants everybody to know what's taking place. And then he comes, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet. He fell down before Christ with a brokenness, with a heart that was ready to praise God. What a miraculous transformation in his life that led to joy-filled, excited worship. Can I say, I wonder how different our worship corporately would be if we took the time to look at our hands and our skin and feel the nerves of our spiritual life transformed by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Would we stand and sing songs without joy and passion? Would we complain about the songs that are chosen? If they're praising God, maybe that's not the preferred style of song that we would have, but it's still lifting up praise to God and thanksgiving. If we truly took time to meditate on the grace of God that we have in Christ, how much that would transform our worship. This man was not concerned about other, what others thought of him. Jesus transformed him and he worshiped in a loud voice to all, all to hear. How, how passionate would, would our prayer life be if we truly stopped to think about what God has done for us? How attentive would we be for every word from God's word that is proclaimed to us? How about our evangelism? Are we truly overwhelmed by, by the healing that we've received so that we want others to know about that healing. I want, one preacher said, you know, as a, as a pastor, we're just one beggar showing other beggars where to find bread. In this tech context, I'm just one leper showing a bunch of lepers where to find healing. But that's what evangelism is. Evangelism is just that. It's, it's a bunch of us lepers that Christ has met us, healed us, and now we get to tell other people our story. Hey, I want to tell you about this man I met Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for me. I was, I was in a miserable condition in my sin, and he, he saved me through his going to the cross for me. He took my sin. I have a reconciled life with God. I have eternity with God. I have forgiveness of sin, not because of anything I've done, but because of him. And you can have that too. One leper telling another leper where to find healing. How different would our evangelism be if we took the time to preach the gospel to ourselves every single day. This man held nothing back and neither should we. Verses 17 and 18, Jesus asked three questions, rhetorical questions. We're not ten cleansed? Yes. The answer is yes. Jesus knew that. He wasn't asking for someone to clarify. Jesus was saying, we're not ten cleansed? Yes. Where are the other nine? Jesus knew. They were going to the priest, where he sent them to. Was no one found to return and give praise to God? Notice this, right? Going to the priest, going to the temple, doing the acts of obedience. Perhaps worship, but maybe a dead worship. A, 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 a kind of a, a blah. I've been healed. That's great. This man comes back, and it's, it's genuine, heartfelt, thanksgiving, praise, and worship. Jesus gives praise to the one who comes back, not to the nine who went to the temple and offered sacrifices. Think about this. There were nine men who went. There's five, 45 sacrifices were made to God because of this. All this worship in the temple, Jesus saying, was, was not any more to be found except for this one who returned to praise God? God's looking at our hearts more than our obedience. Now, our, our obedience is a sign of our heart, but, but this man first had a heart that was rendered before the Lord and said, I am broken before you. You healed me, and I give you everything. And then he he points out the fact that this one was a Samaritan. 
Samaritans were despised by the Jews and vice versa. They didn't usually hang out. That, once again, tells us the miserable condition of the lepers, the fact that this group of ten included what we'll assume were, were Jewish men from Galilee and then this Samaritan. And only the foreigner returned. Why was it only the foreigner? Why did Jesus, why does Luke share that detail? Why does Jesus point that out? I believe it was a rebuke to God's people. Those who should have had a deep sensitivity to God's work and be quick to praise were glad to receive the healing but failed to give thanks and praise. The other nine were busy with religious practice. They missed the ultimate goal of it all. Even though they're obeying the law of God, they missed it. It's, it's so easy for us to get busy with, with life, with ministry, with church, that we forget our highest calling is that is a life of praise to God through Christ Jesus. Jesus declares in verse 18, or 19, he says, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. There's something interesting that, that Luke uses three words for healing here. Back in, in verse 14, he says, they were on their way and they were cleansed. And that is speaking of the, the physical healing, but also kind of the, the, the ceremonial healing cleansing that they were going to receive from the priest. They were cleansed. And the man in verse 15, he looks and he sees that he was healed. It's focusing on the, the physical healing. And in verse 19 here, it says that you've been made well. Again, it's the physical, but this word here is the Greek word that can also be translated saved. Go, your faith has saved you. You've been rescued. There's something more intense there. There's a uh, a, a wonderful aspect of being declared saved. One commentator um, put it this way. The others were cleansed. This one was declared. One commentator said the other nine were declared clean by the priest. This man was declared saved by the Son of God. What a reminder that we can be declared good by others, but only God knows our heart. Only he declares us saved through faith in Christ. And that salvation should lead us to lives of worship-filled thanksgiving. Friends, too far too, far too often we're, we are blinded by our own prosperity. As American Christians, we have a lot. And sometimes I wonder if we're, we're so blinded by our prosperity we forget to thank God the one who has given it to us. And we're so blinded by our prosperity that we don't, we don't give unrestrained praise and thanksgiving to God. Like the other nine, we're, we're consumed with, with life and doing church, if you would. We've accepted the things from the hand of God almost without, with an expectation of somehow we, we deserve it. How, how different would our ministry, our ministries, our lives, our prayer, our worship, our reading and studying of the scriptures, how different would our evangelism be? How different would all of this be if we remember our broken, unclean, desperate, sinful condition and the miraculous healing that we have through Christ. So this morning, as, as we kind of come to close of this, this passage, I'm going to ask first, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's a picture here. And Luke puts this picture right as Jesus is on his way to the cross. He's, he's putting this in this place, in this text, for us to be reminded of of our sinful condition. Every one of us is a sinner. Every one of us has, has offended our holy God. And God's standard of perfection, we have fallen short. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. What that means is that every one of us, because of our sin, is facing eternity separated from God. Under the, the wrath of God for our sinfulness. And, and we cannot be good enough. There's not a scale that this is our, our sin on this side and this is our goodness on this side. It's not like we're trying to 
balance the scale somehow. The reality is our sin to a holy God is, is so heavy, no matter what we do, we cannot make it right. We cannot make up for our sinfulness, no matter how good you are. And so the, the scale has to be thrown away because the only one who's able to make things right is God himself. Our condition as a, as a leper is that we have sin and our sin condition means that we can't cure ourselves. Only God can bring healing. God sent his son Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity who remained fully God but became fully, completely human as well. He went to the cross, and the significance of the cross is that when he went to the cross, it says that he who knew no sin, he was without sin, he lived a perfect life, he had no sin in, a, in himself, but our sin was put on him. And being human, he was able to be our sacrifice. Being fully God, he was able to be the sacrifice for all of humanity from all time in all places. And so even though it was 2,000 years ago, his sacrifice 2,000 years ago, because he was fully God, is sufficient for you today. He took your sin. He took your shame. He paid the full penalty for your sin. The Bible says that it's a free gift then given to us. Those who trust in Jesus Christ, and there's no magic prayer, there's no magic formula. It's just you saying, God, I'm a leper. I'm a sinner, and I can't take and get rid of my own sin, but I trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sin because of what Christ did for me, and I want to live for you as a response to the grace that I have in Jesus Christ. We call it the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. We're sinners in need of a Savior. Jesus paid the penalty, and if we trust in Him, we have the promise our sin is forgiven, all of it taken and forgiven, and we're fully loved and accepted by God. That's the miraculous transformation that we have, much like the, sinner, the, the leper here who's, who's healed. If, if you've heard that gospel message before, maybe today's the first time you're like, you know what? It makes sense. I need Christ. Before you leave today, talk with me, talk with anyone who's up front here, talk with the person next to you. If they don't know how to answer it, bring them to me because they need to hear it too. The majority of you in the room I've had the opportunity to talk to, and I know you've already trusted Jesus Christ. Let me encourage you in this. There's a phrase, we're to preach the gospel daily to ourselves. Why? So that we have a heart of thanksgiving. You see, when, when we forget what Christ has done for us, and we don't preach the gospel to ourselves every single day, we begin to take on an air of I deserve it. And, and, and I was convicted by this this past week. As, as, even as a pastor, there's times I get in the routine of doing pastor stuff. And I can forget to just fall on my face before God and say, thank you. I deserve none of what you've given me. I don't deserve the salvation you've given me. I don't deserve the grace you've given me. I don't deserve the things you've laid before me. I left up my thanks to you. And I realize I've got to preach the gospel to myself every single day before I preach it to you. How different our church will be, how different our lives will be if we take this to heart and, and have lives that are thankful in all that we do. Before, we, before I close us in prayer, I, I thought for our prayer response this morning, we'll do something a little different. Back in, in verse 15, when he was healed, he came back praising God with a loud voice. And I thought it'd be one of those times to make those of you who are introverts a little more uncomfortable. We're going to shout together. I'm an introvert, okay? So I understand being uncomfortable with things. But, um, so here's what we're going to do. I want to encourage each other. I want us to encourage each other. So, so I want us to respond, crying out in a loud voice, and, and finish this statement and this will be a prayer of response that we have to the Lord. Lord, I thank you for. Just cry out. Lord, I thank you for and fill it in. Let's, let's do that together. So one, you know, whoever, just shout it out from where you're at for everyone to hear it. Lord, I thank you for.
Father, we offer up these words of praise and thanksgiving to you. Lord, we are people who are sinners, redeemed by Christ, and we offer up our words of thanks. Lord, may we, may we encourage one another with words of thanksgiving. May we lift your name up high in all that we do. Continue to work in us that we may be people who are recognizing our miserable condition in sin, but the miraculous transformation that you have done in us through Christ, that we might have worship-filled lives, filled with thanksgiving in all that we do, that we give thanks in all circumstances, because this is what we've been called to do, and because we know we can, because we're in Christ. Father, I thank you for your grace and your salvation. I thank you for this church. I thank you for God's people who know you and love you and love on each other and encourage each other. May you be magnified in this place as we follow you for your glory and your glory alone. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing uh, a song of thanksgiving to God.
Go ahead and have a seat for a moment. So one of the things that uh, is really a, a neat blessing of, of a church of this size is to have so many children. Uh, you know, we have, have little babies in the service during the sermon who are crying and making noise, and that's great. Um, no, I, I, I enjoy hearing it because it's a reminder that God is at work in this place, and we have young and old and everything in between. Uh, I want the children to stand for a second. Children, stand up. Are you guys standing? Can we see you? <laughs> All right. It might not work as well. So, so we, we have, uh, tonight is going to be the first night of our vacation Bible school. And the reason we do it is for these little faces here to be discipled and taught the Word of God. You guys can sit down. Now I want all the volunteers that are part of BBS to stand up. You, those who helped with all the decorations and the set, the drama team, the teachers, the various leaders that are going to be taking part. I want to pray for you as we commit this week to the Lord. You know, these kind of events, the, the outreach events that we do, are an extension of what should be our life of evangelism, right? This doesn't replace us going and talking with individuals about Jesus Christ. This, the Food Truck Fridays, all those outreach events and community events are just uh, an extension of what we should be doing. Um, but I want to pray for this event as, as our children are coming out and many parents have already been investing in their children with the gospel. And they get to hear the fact that we're in a battle this week, uh, a spiritual battle between God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. And they're going to hear about putting on the armor of God. It's a great series from Ephesians 6. And so we're going to pray that all that takes place will be to the Lord's work on hearts uh, and then also there's children coming from outside our church, some coming from other churches, but some coming and their parents may not know the Lord. And this is an opportunity for God's word to go to their hearts as well. So let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. As, as lepers sharing of the miraculous transformation through Christ to other lepers. And Lord, I thank you for those who have committed to being part of the VBS team over this week. And I pray for every volunteer, whatever their role may be, may, may you give them endurance and strength and uh, clarity of heart on why they're doing what they do. Uh, Lord, may their service to you be used in, in the lives of our children and the children coming from our community. Uh, and Lord, may you use this week to strengthen uh, the faith and the understanding in our children's lives. May, may their testimony of faith be used in the lives of their parents. Lord, we pray that you would be at work. We can do a whole lot of activity, but unless your spirit's at work in the lives of, of children and adults alike, we know that it is fruitless. But as we do this event over the next couple of days, and as we teach your word, as we uh, have fun together. We pray that your spirit be at work in our midst, transforming lives, and that you would receive all the glory. And Lord, we give you thanks already for what you will do in our midst over the coming week. And again, I, I thank you for uh, every person who is giving of their time uh, to, to lead this, this time, and we commit this to you. And Lord, again, we thank you for our Zambia team that is presently ministering to children uh, and others in Zambia, we thank you for a safe journey, and we pray for your continued work in their lives as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody stand together as we uh, close out our time together. Uh, a few announcements. I encourage you as you head out, if you did not receive a bulletin on your way in, pick one up. Uh, announcements in there, things going on in the life of the church here at Faith. If you're a first-time guest with us today, we are so glad you're here, uh, and hopefully you received a welcome uh, folder, a blue welcome folder, gives more information about our church. Uh, if you didn't receive one, uh, there are some in either of the foyers. Make sure you grab one on your way out. And there's an information card in there. We'd love for you to fill it out and put that in the offering box by one of the doors. Um, one announcement I want to draw to your attention on the back of the bulletin is about Pinebrook Week. Uh, Pinebrook Week, uh, Pinebrook Bible Conference is up in Stroudsburg. And uh, July 9th through the 14th is our week. Uh, Sunday through Friday, uh, and what Pinebrook Week is, it's a time when we as, as individuals and families from this church get together with 
others from other churches for a week at Pinebrook. We, we have great fellowship together. We, we play together. There's Bible study together. There's great teaching in the scriptures. And so I encourage you to come out for that week. Uh, there are some spots available if you wanted to try and get your whole week family up there for a week. If you can't do a whole week at this point, I know it's kind of late to sign up for a week away. If you want to do a day, there are, there's an opportunity if you want to go up and check it out for a day. Uh, so look at the dates there, and you can go to Pinebrook's website, check it out. You can call the church office, and Dawn will give you more information. Uh, with VBS tonight, we do need to change a couple things in here. So this section over here, all those chairs are going to need to come down. All right, so each of you take a chair and move it. No, just kidding. So if you're able to stick around afterwards and help to take that section down and move a couple other chairs around and make things set up for tonight, um, we'd appreciate that. And Tony, you're going to coordinate, or who's coordinating the setup? Brian. Brian just got voluntold, but he's coordinating the setup. So, um, so if you're able to help out, Brian's got a red shirt on. He's already set up to volunteer. So, so talk with Brian, and he'll tell you where to go. So. Our, our benediction comes from Numbers chapter 6, and this is the, the blessing that God gave for Aaron to speak over the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless. Have a great day.